Well, good morning and welcome. It is Resurrection Sunday and God is good, amen. We are so happy to have each and every one of you here this morning. It's a, it's a crowded room, so if you have room and you can slide toward the inside of your aisle, we might be able to make room for some of those who can't get to the balcony. We are so excited that you're here. I know that the spirit of the Lord inhabits the praises of his people, and we are so looking forward to praising his name this morning. We'll begin in just a few minutes, but before we do, could I pray for us? Let's pray. Gracious God, you are so good. Father, we thank you on this Resurrection Sunday that we get to remember the goodness and the wonder of the cross. It is my prayer for every person in this room and watching on TV and online that we would never lose the wonder of your gift to us on the cross. Father God, I pray that you would come this morning, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us, that our hearts would be ready to receive what it is you have for us. We love you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. King of kings left heaven's throne To make our brokenness his home To heal the sick and help the blind to see To crush the sin and set the sinner free Oh, what a Savior So I could live Oh, what a Savior Oh, what a friend One final step of His perfect plan Involved nail-pierced feet and nail-pierced hands A crown of thorns adorned our key Not quite the image of victory And yet that's the price that he paid for me Oh, what a Savior, what a friend The greatest love that there has ever been He laid his life down so I could live Savior, what a friend He breathed His last and the skies went gray Crucified in a criminal's place One final breath and all hope seemed lost As the Savior hung on that criminal's cross For the King of kings scared the kings of men And so they did their best to make his kingdom men They sealed him in a gaudy grave But that was only enough for just three days Yeah, only enough for three days, y'all Then Jesus rose in victory He said, death, you've got no hold on me For you cannot stop the King of Kings Yeah, He died and rose and resurrected me He broke the 
Church, you all can be seated as we celebrate a baptism. Well, good morning, church. He is risen. Amen. Amen. I'm so thankful this morning we get to share a very sacred moment with the Taylor family. I'm so excited for them, but I'm very thankful that Rusty is here. He's going to be uh, doing the baptism this morning, and he's Ty's dad. Rusty served on staff here as pastor for 31 years. So thankful for him. Yeah. Rusty, if you will. Through the sacrament of baptism, God proclaims his love and extends his grace to us even before we can understand it. When a child is baptized... The parents declare their faith in Jesus Christ, their love for the church, and accept responsibility for disciplining their child in the Christian faith with both God's help and with your help as well. Because we all are a family. We're brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. So now, Ty and Alyssa and big sister, Kaya Emmeline, as you present this beautiful little baby for baptism, do you profess your own faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Will you work with God's help to keep your children under the ministry and guidance of the church so they, at some point in the future, will accept Jesus Christ as their own personal Lord and Savior? Okay. And by what name will the child be baptized? Ann Willis Jane. Ann Willis Jane. We have to wake up a little bit. Okay. Ann Willis Jane, we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come on, let's go meet your church family. Look over here. Look, there are your singers and your choir. Say hey. Say take good care of me. <laughs> let's pray together. Holy God, what a wonderful thing it is to bring children before you, knowing that your divine grace has gone before them and that your blessing is upon them. Holy Lord, would you take care of this family? Would you give them wisdom, give them strength, give them understanding that they may raise this child in the Christian faith? And one day, Ann Willis Jane will accept for herself Jesus Christ as her personal Lord and Savior. We lift this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, if you don't mind, yeah, you can clap. If you don't mind, would you please stand to your feet and then look around you for somebody you don't know and introduce yourself.
If you're in the room, would you join me in welcoming them? I also want to welcome any guests that we have this morning. We are so glad that you're here. In the pew in front of you, in the back of it, you'll find this blue welcome card. If you would, just take a minute to fill this out. You can put it in one of the offering plates. They'll go by in just a minute. You can bring it back out to Connection Point in the atrium. It's just a way to let us know a little bit more about you and how we can better serve you as a church. And if you're watching on TV or online, you can text CONNECT to the number that you'll see on the screen. Well, we've come to the time in our worship service where we focus on how good the Lord has been as our provider and how we can show him our love and our commitment by giving back a portion of what he's given us. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask our ushers to come into place. They're gonna come and they're gonna stand at the front of the altar and we're gonna pray for our offering. And I just wanna remind you, church, that this is part of our lives as Christians. It's part of how we show the Lord that we love and we trust him. Everything we have is his. And we, we're gonna pray that he's gonna take it and he's gonna do mighty things in the world around us. The ministries of Frazier, both here in our community, but also around the world. So will you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you that you are Jehovah Jireh. God, we thank you for the many blessings that you've given us, Lord. As your children, we want to be faithful, God, to give back just a small portion of what you've given us, Lord, so that you can take it and you can multiply it and you can use it for your kingdom's cause here and around the world. Lord, we thank you for the generosity of your people and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as they're passing the plates, I want to remind you that you can give that way, but you can also give. There's boxes in the back of the worship center. You can text the number that you'll see on the screen. As always, you can give in our secure app and website. Well, this morning at our 8.30 service, we had 12 of our young men and women from our student ministry come, and they stood before the church, and they proclaimed their faith. They confirmed their faith in Jesus, and they said that I wanna live for Jesus for the rest of their life, and we praise God for those 12. Yes. <laughs> Amen.
men, and in just a little while at the close of the service, we'll see them baptized along with some others. We look forward to celebrating that moment. Well, there's a few things we want you to know going on in the life of our church. Coming up this Wednesday night, we have a midweek service. It happens at six o'clock in the East Sanctuary. And you know, sometimes as a Christian, there's hard questions that we ask ourselves. We all go through seasons where it's difficult to hear from God. And so we're gonna be tackling that topic as Pastor Chris comes on Wednesday and gives a sermon entitled, When God Seems Silent, What to Do When You Can't Hear His Voice. So we encourage you, we hope that you'll attend. Again, it's six o'clock in the East Sanctuary this Wednesday. And then again on Sunday, a week from today, we're gonna be starting a new sermon series. It's called Living the Victorious Life. It's a study of the book of Joshua. You know, in the Gospel of John, Jesus says that he came to give us life and to give us abundant life. But I fear that sometimes as Christians, we're just barely hanging on. And that's not the life that we want for you. And so we want you to come every Sunday, I challenge you, and hear about what it means to live the victorious life that Jesus talks about. We'll begin that next week. And along with that sermon series, we'll have a daily devotional. You can actually pick this book up today. It's in the bookstore. You can order it from Amazon. It's also free in the Fraser app. You can get a notification every morning to go through this journey every day, going through the book of Joshua. So we encourage you to do that if you haven't already committed to do so. And then again next Sunday, we're going to be having a new member orientation. So perhaps you've been visiting for a while and you wanna know what it really means to be a member of this faith family. We'd love to answer your questions. All you gotta do is again, find that welcome card in the back of the pew in front of you, fill it out. We'll let you, it lets us know that you're coming. You can even just show up if you need to. But it'll take you through what we believe at the Frasier as a Free Methodist Church and we hope that you'll plan to attend. It's 9.45 next Sunday. It's gonna be in the chapel, or East Sanctuary, I should say. So we hope that you'll plan to attend that. And then finally, we have something called, uh, coming up called our Mental Health Summit. Mental health is a huge issue in uh, our world today. So many people battling with anxiety and depression and we wanna be a light, a source of hope in the world around us. And so we're hosting that. It's gonna be May 4th at nine o'clock. It's a Saturday. We'd like, uh, we need you to register to attend though. We've got um, our keynote speaker. It's Kathy Sarkis. She's the director of a counseling center in Egypt and many other amazing speakers. So we hope that you'll plan to attend what's gonna be a really powerful um, and world-changing mental health summit in May. Well, before we continue, I would love to read some of the words of God from his scripture. So would you stand if you're able and we'll read from his word. <clears throat> Our first scripture comes from Isaiah. It's chapter 26, verses 19, and it says, your dead shall live. Their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. For your dew is a dew of light and the earth will give birth to the dead. And our second verse is John 6, 44, and it says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You can be seated. Well, again, good morning. As we open up God's word together, would you pray with me? Father, we thank you. We thank you for what this day means. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the empty tomb. Lord, we thank you for your word. And now we ask that you would speak to us. Lord, you have the ability through your Holy Spirit to speak to each and every one of us right here, right now. So Lord, give us ears to hear, hearts to receive what it is you have for each of us. We pray this in Jesus' good and powerful name and everybody said, Amen, amen. The topic of spirituality is a very popular topic today. And this is nothing new. Uh, the topic of spirituality has been a very popular topic throughout the centuries in many different ways. In fact, most people on the planet today claim to be spiritual in one sense or another, and there are many religious forms that that takes. One of those religious forms is Christianity itself. But there's a problem, and the problem has to do with and about and around the topic of resurrection. See, the problem with resurrection is that it is consistently and constantly talked about, alluded to, foreshadowed, and promised throughout Scripture. 
First, there's the resurrection of the Messiah himself. Second, there's the resurrection of the Messiah's people to come. The problem with the resurrection is that all the messages and metaphors, well, they're so numerous. All you have to do is just look through scripture and you see the resurrection either talked about as we just saw from Isaiah or alluded to in some way. Take Joseph, for example. We just walked through his story as a church just a couple of months ago. Joseph was the one who went down into the pit, being placed there by the hands of his brothers, those people who were supposed to love him. Well, this points to Jesus. And it points to the resurrection because he came out of that pit. Or think about Jonah being in the belly of the whale for three days. And then there in the belly of the whale, he declares salvation belongs to the Lord. Again, pointing to Jesus in the resurrection. Or take David. David who poetically described this descent into the grave and then back out again. Again, pointing to Jesus in the resurrection. Or what about the prophets? You have the prophets proclaiming a day that will be unlike any other day. There's a day coming when all the world will be made right. And for some people, it will be a day of rejoicing. And for others, it is a day to be feared. The thread of resurrection runs all the way through the scriptures, all the way down to the very last book. When you come to the revelation where there John describes a throne and only one who is worthy to approach the throne and only one who is worthy to sit on the throne. And in the Revelation, there are repeated pictures of this day, this day of resurrection that is coming. You see, the problem with resurrection, again, is it has been a constant and consistent theme that cannot be denied by any serious reader of Scripture, much less a serious student of Scripture. And it's one thing to read it and believe it. It's another thing to read it and to not believe it. But the theme of resurrection, as it is alluded to in all of its various literary forms, cannot be denied. It can be ignored, but it cannot be denied. And there's the problem. The problem is that if we claim to be spiritual and resurrection is not the basis for our spirituality, the problem is we have to be honest with ourselves in that moment and say, We're actually not a Christian. Let me say that again. The problem with the resurrection and all of its uh, being mentioned over and over throughout scripture, the problem with it is that if we claim to be spiritual, but the resurrection is not the basis for our spirituality, then we must be honest and admit that we are actually not a Christian. The resurrection was promised by Isaiah, the verse we just read. Your dead shall live. Their bodies shall rise. You you hear the language. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. For your dew is a dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. Do you see the resurrection language? The resurrection was promised by Jesus himself. John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. But we see it over and over again. For example, in Paul, the resurrection was promised by Paul, Romans 6, 8. Now, if we have died with, it, with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Or 1 Corinthians 6, 14 says that God raised the Lord. He raised the Lord Jesus and will also raise us up by his power. John says the same thing, 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is, as the glorified and resurrected Savior. All of this talk about resurrection throughout history and throughout the scripture raises a very crucial question for anybody who is considering questions about life or life after death. And that question that I think we have to consider is why is the resurrection so important? Why is the resurrection so important to me and my life now? What does the resurrection have to do with my life today? Meaning as we sit here in this service, does the resurrection have any bearing on us? Is the resurrection just one of those things that God did in this person named Jesus a long ago? Or is resurrection just something that Christians talk about as a 
possible thing that may happen in the future. Again, does the resurrection have any bearing on me and on you as we gather in this room today? I think it does, and I want to give you a few realities of the resurrection. If you'd like to take notes, point number one is this. It is that the resurrection is my cure. It's the cure for my fear of death. It cures me, it cures you. There is one thing that is absolutely universal to every human being on the planet, and that is the fear of death. And not just death itself, but there's a fear that resides in our heart and mind about the topic of death. You can go into any culture today, and you're going to find a large and swelling population of people who fear the very end of their lives. And again, this is nothing new. In the first century, Jesus encountered a woman in John 11, and this fear had gripped her heart and mind. She had just lost her brother. And while she was complaining that Jesus did not seem to be present because he could have possibly done something about this, Jesus looks into this woman's eyes and he says something that overrides the fear that we all live with. In John 11, 25, Jesus looks at this particular woman on this particular day and he says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Never die. There's not an eternal death. And then he looks at her and he says, do you believe this? Do you actually believe this? The question that Jesus is posing to this woman in John 11 is the same question he is asking me and you today. Do we actually believe this? Do we actually believe that even though our physical bodies may die, that there's this category called never dying? Do we believe it? And again, I think as we come to this Easter service today, that is the question for each of us. Do we actually believe Jesus? Do we believe him? Whenever we start believing him and believing in his resurrection power, all of a sudden, death begins to lose its grip on our heart and mind. But that's not the only fear. Point number two is this, is that the resurrection is the cure for my fear of judgment. Not just the fear of death, but also the fear of judgment. And even the greatest doubters among us will admit that there is this idea of what happens at the end. What happens after the end? The truth is, when it comes to the topic of judgment, this is a topic that we understand and we appreciate and even desire at some points in our life. Because judgment reveals that there's the possibility of a just decision that could be made on our behalf. Because when we are harmed, when we are the one who has been wronged, that's when we call for judgment and justice. However, this fear, though, that we live with of judgment after this life, this fear is real. It's a fear of the unknown. It's a fear of what will happen next. But what Scripture tells us is that when you are in Christ, when you embrace him, when you embrace what he has done in his resurrection, it is the resurrection then that cures this fear of judgment. Jesus put it this way in John 5. John 5, 24 and 25, Jesus makes two amazing statements. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. He goes on, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead, the spiritually dead will hear the voice of the son of God. They will hear it. And those who hear will live. Once again, Jesus tells us that we are called to hear his words. And that word hear in this particular place is not just to hear them audibly, but to hear them and heed them, hear them and embrace them, hear uh, hear them and believe them. And it's in this embrace and this belief. We're not just giving in to some kind of wishful thinking, hoping that There'll be something one day after this life is over, then all that will be taken care of. No, no, no. We're admitting that, yes, there is a judgment to come. But for those who are in Christ, you will never have to stand before the Lord in fear. You will never have to stand before the Lord in fear of guilt, in fear of shame, and in fear of all the pain that you have received, but also that you have inflicted on others because of your sin. No, no, no. It's all dealt with in Christ. 
So the resurrection deals not only though with those future fears that we have, but the resurrection also deals with who we are right now, with what we're going through right now. Point number three is this, is that the resurrection helps me suffer with purpose in a world of emptiness. What I know about a room this big is that there are many of us right now who are suffering. Suffering in different ways, going through different things, experiencing different kinds of losses. And one of the facts of life is that every one of us either are suffering right now or we will suffer in some way. And yes, it looks different for different people. And yes, we wonder why it looks different for different people at the same time. We have to acknowledge the fact that every single person who walks this planet will suffer in some way. And just as the resurrection deals with my fear of death, and just as the resurrection deals with my fear of judgment, it also deals with the reality of my suffering and of your suffering. Because in the resurrection, suffering takes on a new meaning. Suffering takes on a new meaning because now we who are in Christ can identify with Christ as the suffering Savior. Paul puts it this way in Romans 8, 17. He says, if we are in fact children of God, then we are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Notice that word glorified. Peter picks up on this theme in 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13. He says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, verse 13, but rejoice, rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory, there's the word again, is revealed. Both Paul and Peter point out that all of us in our suffering, that that suffering for those who are in Christ, it leads to this thing called glory. What Paul and Peter do is they connect all the various forms of the suffering that you and I go through in life and connect those sufferings to Christ's sufferings. And again, no one likes the idea of suffering. No one likes the possibility of suffering. But in Christ, we see God step into human history and show us that in every season of suffering, there is the glory of resurrection at the end of that season. You can't find any kind of hope like that anywhere else. Only in Christ, the God who came and suffered alongside of us and even for us. Point number four is that the resurrection helps me endure with truth in a world of deception. Resurrection helps me endure, but not just endure, endure with truth in a world of deception. Just as no one is immune from suffering, None of us are also immune from being drawn into the unhealthy schemes of the world, and they are many. And with this world being the reality that we live in, it is the resurrection that helps us endure. It helps us push forward. It helps us move forward in life. When Paul was writing his last letter to this young man named Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, he tells him, this is a trustworthy saying. I want you to listen to this trustworthy saying, Timothy, he says. Here's the saying. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Notice the progression. Notice the progression of God's call for each and every one of us. The first call is to come and die. And you come and die to self so that you can live for him. And then what that helps us do is endure. We endure. We continue to push forward so that we may reign with him. And then comes the warning. The warning is if you deny him because there is no coercion or forcefulness in God, he will honor your denial of him and therefore deny you. Do you see what the trustworthy saying is saying? It is telling us, yes, you can endure. With all the complexity of deception that's out there in the world, yes, you can endure. You are not hopeless and you are not helpless in that sense. And yes, you can endure so that you also may reign with him. All of this is possible because of the first thing, we have moved from death 
to life, meaning we've experienced resurrection power in us, and it's that same resurrection power that moves us through this life all the way into the next called glory. Point number five. Point number five is that the resurrection helps me lay down my self-indulgence in a world of materialism. Is the resurrection that helps me lay down my self-indulgence in a world of materialism. There is no debate that the world we live in and the culture that we breathe in and out every single day derives all of its power in life from this thing called materialism. And you may be wondering, what does that word mean? Simply put, materialism is a love for material things, a love for created things if you put it in, biblical, in a biblical perspective. Materialism means that we love the creation more than the creator. But it is the resurrection that calls us again and again to lay down our desires, to lay down our passions, to lay down this drive that we have in us for the things of this world. Now you may be sitting there going, well, I expect you, Chris, you're a preacher, to say something like that. Why in the world would I ever actually do it? Well, Jesus put it this way in John 12. John 12, 24, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Remember, if we die with him, we live. Jesus goes on, whoever loves his life, meaning life here, loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Do you see the paradox? We have to lose in order to gain. We have to die in order to live. And here Jesus teaches us that in death, that is when the fruit of life actually comes. It's in the laying down of all of our fallen desires that we actually experience abundance in life. It's in the laying down of all those things that we desperately crave that we experience abundant life because abundant life is not in consuming. It's not in hoarding. It is in giving. It is in laying down, which is exactly what Jesus did for us. And there has been nobody walked this planet to live a more abundant life than Jesus himself. Number six is that the resurrection is what gives me courage in a world full of anxiety. We live in an age of anxiety. I don't have to convince you of that. That's just numbers. We are more technologically advanced than ever before and we are more anxiety riven than ever before. And while we seek out many different ways to help us handle the anxiety or cope with the anxiety, what we see in the resurrection is a confident expectation that this world cannot give. That's why Paul would write in 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 9, so we, those who are in Christ, the church, we are always of good courage. Notice that, good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, he says. He repeats himself. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Now notice this. Notice that why is Paul saying that we should be of good courage? Well, there's something about the aim of my life being to please God that brings that kind of courage and confidence that I need. And he tells us right here that there are these two realities that we live with. In one sense, we're at home in this earthly body, in one sense, and yet there is a greater home in a heavenly body with the Lord. And our home in that resurrected body with the Lord is what causes us to walk by faith and not by sight. It's what causes us to have good courage, godly courage, not self-made courage. We try that all the time on our own. We try to muster up courage to tackle the issues of life. No, he wants us to have this good courage, this godly courage, this courage that comes from heaven. And heavenly courage 
He wants us to have so that we can know that the anxiety of this world and that the anxiety that this world causes in us can never hold us back or keep us from our heavenly home. That's why I say all the time, we as Christians do not hope for a future. We hope from the future. We bring the future heavenly reality into the present. We hope from the future because we know what the future is going to be. Every one of us lives with anxiety on some level. Every single person. I don't care if you're a man and you're trying to act tough. Every single one of us live with some level of anxiety in our life. But we get to crucify that anxiety because the resurrected one told us we could. See, you can walk by faith in a future heavenly reality, and you don't have to walk in this anxiety-producing world, only what you see around you. You walk by faith, not just by sight, and everything that produces anxiety in your life will one day not exist. You do realize that. Everything that produces anxiety in your life will not exist in heaven. So whenever we have this heavenly hope because of this heavenly home and we pull that into the present, that is what overrides this fear, this anxiety that we live with. Number seven is that the resurrection is the cure for my fear of eternity. The resurrection is the cure for my fear of eternity. Now, this is closely related to the fear of death. It's closely related to the fear of judgment, but it's different. The very concept of eternity is something that our finite minds cannot comprehend. We try, but we can't. But we are capable of understanding the vastness of this thing called eternity. And while many times we think of this idea of eternity, we just think of this large black hole that has no end and seems to not have a beginning. The idea of eternity is so unknown that it can become unnerving to us. And yes, there are a lot of things about eternity that we do not know. I mean, I've never been, have you? Right? But while there are things about eternity that we do not know, and we will not know this side of it, There are at least two things we can know. One is that we can know where we will spend it. And two is we can know who we will spend eternity with. We can know where we will spend it. And we can know who we will spend it with. Now, as a preacher, you're probably on Easter Sunday, expecting me to say something like that, right? You're expecting me to say that, just like I'm expecting you to be thinking about lunch right now. (laughs) I get it. My stomach's growling too. Well, there's a lot we can't know. We can know. We can know where we'll spend it, who we'll spend it with. We can know something. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4, 14, you can know something, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you, the church, into his presence. You can know this. Or Colossians 3, 4, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You can know that. Look at that verse. Notice if you take four words out of that verse, it turns into a question. Who is your life? He says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, oh, then you'll also, you'll appear with him in glory. But if you take those four words out, who is your life? That question gets at, do you know? There's a lot you can't know about eternity, but you can know where you're going to spend it and who you're going to spend it with. And the who starts with God himself. And it goes all the way down to all those who believe in the crucified and resurrected Lord. That you can know. And so my simple question to you on this Easter Sunday is, do you know? Do you actually know? 
Do you know for yourself where you're going to spend eternity? And again, you expect people like me who do things like this to ask those kind of questions. That's fine. I don't care. You do realize eternity is in the balance. Therefore, the question is, do you know? Because you can. You can know where you will spend it and who you will spend it with. My prayer is that if you don't know, that you will make that clear very soon. Amen? Amen. Father, would you help us? Would you help us know? Would you help us know the reality of the resurrection? That in you overcoming this one universal fear that we all have, that you overcoming all the anxiety that this world produces in us, all the deception, Lord, may we see in the resurrection the cure, the healing for all of that. Lord, may we not fear eternity. Lord, today, may we walk with our heads held high knowing that if today were my last day, I have no fear. Lord, I thank you for those who are gonna be baptized in just a moment, who are coming to declare themselves, not that they have given mental assent to something, but that they have moved from death to life. May we all say the same today. Lord, we love you. We really do. And we thank you for loving us. We pray this in Jesus' good and powerful name. And everybody said. Well, church, as we respond to what we have heard today, we're also gonna be experiencing baptisms this morning. But as we do, we're gonna have a couple different things going on. Uh, maybe there is someone in the room this morning who is wrestling with the fact of whether or not they do know. And maybe you want prayer. This is my friend, Audrey. Audrey's one of our uh, candidates for deacon around here. And she's gonna be on this side of the stage. And if you are just, you need somebody to pray with her in these closing moments, she's gonna be there. Just make eye contact with her. And she would love to pray with you as you think through that. But also while that's going on, we're gonna be celebrating baptisms. I cannot think of a better way to end this Easter celebration with baptisms. We've got two types of baptisms that are gonna be happening this morning. Our friend Garrett's gonna be baptized by sprinkling. And then after that, we've got several others who are gonna be baptized by immersion, but regardless of how they're baptized this morning, we're gonna erupt into praise when these people are baptized. So if you're with me this morning on that, would you stand to your feet as we worship and celebrate together?
breath Till that stone was moved for good For the lamb and conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born
was borrowed for three days His body there would not remain Our God has one more time for these beautiful souls. What joy. Have you ever listened to a sermon and you feel like the preacher's just speaking right to you and you get that little feeling in your gut and you just know the Holy Spirit's kind of speaking that gentle voice that He gives. If, if He spoke to you today, I encourage you, don't let a day go by without responding. Don't let a day go by without being obedient. We'd love to pray for you, whatever it is. We'll have a prayer volunteer at the stained glass windows. You can grab me or one of the pastors. We'd love to pray with you. If you're watching on TV or online, you can call or text the number that you see on the screen for prayer. But brothers and sisters, can I just remind you, you, you are the light of the world and the world needs your light. Amen. Yes, so let the joy of the Lord be your strength today and always. Will you receive this benediction before we go? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord turn His face upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. Amen.